Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, please come in and find your seat. Uh, take a moment and order a drink or a, a meal. Um, we're about to get started with the, tonight's program. Uh, my name is Phil Robertson. I uh, am the director of the Asia Human Rights and Labor Advocates. I'm also an FCCT board member. And it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Neil Laughlin, who's come here to speak about his amazing new book, The Politics of Coercion, State and Regime Making in Cambodia. But before we hear from uh, Neil, I'm going to uh, let you know there's a couple interesting events coming up in the, in the coming days at the FCCT that you might be interested in. <coughs> Tomorrow, uh, we have an event looking at the court case against the NSO group, which is the attack of Pegasus spyware in Thailand. Uh, this is a group of NGOs that have filed a lawsuit. Uh, this is ILAW Digital Reach and Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto, uh, talking about uh, the situation that is going on with <coughs> a number of uh, Thai activists who were targeted uh, with uh, the NSO group software. Um, we're also going to, that's tomorrow uh, evening at 7 p.m. Um, here at the FCCT. Next Monday, on the 25th of November at 7 p.m., we're launching the Baturu Cultural Festival, which is uh, recognizing the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Uh, this is uh, the kickoff event for a week of cultural events, films, activities across Bangkok. Uh, come that evening uh, to learn more about what is planned. Uh, it is free and open to the public. On the 27th of November, we have an event on Thailand's cat poems and cat culture, an updated understanding where we will have an author coming to speak about Siamese cats, legends, and realities. That's his book. His name is Martin Clutterbuck. And then we have a lunchtime talk on the 28th at 12 p.m. by Ron Graham talking about the informalist opening um, of Britain in, uh, excuse me, the informal imperialist on Britain and the opening up of Burma. And then on the 29th, we have an event at 11 a.m. with the former foreign minister of Singapore, uh, George Yeo, who's gonna be coming to the club at 11 a.m. on the 29th of uh, November. One last event is uh, next Thursday, the 28th of November, we have wine tasting night. So if you want to come and have some delicious wines, please come at 6 p.m. Um, so uh, a very full agenda of events at the FCCT over the next two weeks in November. But tonight we're here to talk about Cambodia. Um, Neil has uh, done some amazing research about what it underpinning the ongoing repression and abuses in Cambodia. I'm not going to uh, try to describe what he's looked at. He's going to give uh, a very in-depth, detailed report about his book. His book is also for sale uh, at the front. Um, so if you're interested in seeing what he's got to, he's written, please um, go and buy the book. It's there for a aff very affordable 700 baht. So Neil, over to you. <coughs> OK, great. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Okay, so thanks, Phil, for inviting me to speak here at FCC uh, Thai today. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and, yeah, speak about my book, The Politics of Coercion, State and Regime Making in Cambodia. Um, so the book stems from my academic research, um, and this book's been over, uh, well, about 12 years in the making, and it's also rooted in my work as a, a land and human rights monitor in Cambodia, where I worked from about 2012 to 2015, and then I've been back many times since. Um, <clears throat> and the book's based on um, interviews with more than 150 stakeholders. This includes uh, CPP uh, politicians like Sai Samal, uh, General Sal Sakar, Deputy Head of the um, Cambodian, Royal Cambodian Armed Forces, various opposition members, um, NGOs, uh, activists, 
artists, um, uh, rural, urban Cambodians. So I try to kind of get a broad spectrum of, of views. It's also based on uh, archival data. I was, had the opportunity to look at the UNTAC files um, from the uh, 90s, also the uh, PRK um, files from the 1980s. Um, and then also some internal CPP literature, for example, an unreleased party history, which really gave you or gave me an idea of how they think about themselves. Um, and it's also a, a gold mine of, uh, of data. Um, OK, so in essence, what I try and do in the book is provide a historically grounded um, explanation for the durability of the country's authoritarian regime, which, as we all know, has been in power uh, since uh, 1979. And I do this by focusing on the origins, shape, and makeup of its ruling coalition and, and, and the relationship of that coalition to broader society. So I, I define that ruling coalition as political elites, many drawn from within the state security forces, who, in combination with a group of uh, state dependent tycoons, have come to control the country's politics and its economy, essentially now becoming a, a, a ruling class, particularly as they're trying to uh, uh, make this system hereditary into the future. Um, so I argue against uh, literature on Cambodia um, that's tended to focus on economic performance legitimacy until recently electoral, uh, electoral clientelism to explain CPP uh, longevity. And I suggest this focus on clientelism and performance legitimacy has been overblown. Um, and also that we've paid insufficient attention to Cambodia's uh, state society relations, which I, I characterize as intensely coercive um, and which is the focus of the book. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you an overview of the book and its main arguments, and then we can probably get more into the, the nitty-gritty in the Q&A. Um, but what I do then in the book is through close analysis of Cambodia's state and regime making since 79, I show how and why coercion has become embedded as a regime's most important strategic advantage. And I've actually argued this is actually why the CPP is unable to, to, to build this mass clientelist patron uh, client system that was very, very characterized in the literature on Cambodia for a long time, um, even still today, most recently King Un's uh, 2019 book, for example, um, really still talking this same, this same narrative. Um, so what we've seen is a privileging of elite interests and elite cohesion and mutual protection, which has been very much to the expense of ordinary Cambodians. Um, and so while the, system, while, the, while the book is really a kind of study of the system um, that Hun Sen has built, and Hun Sen and his colleagues in his generation has built, this is now the system that Hun Manet is, in, is inheriting and will have to traverse if he wants to stay in power. Um, so, so and, I, and then I talk about the hereditary succession as well in the conclusion, of the conclusion of the book and talking about the dynastic politics that we're really seeing happening in, in, in Cambodia at the moment. Okay. Uh, uh, Neil, move the mic closer to your mouth. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so yeah, the book... Okay, so the book begins with a question. Um, you know, why has the same regime survived in power for nearly half a century? You know, at first glance, it's pretty surprising, or it's, it's, it's at least notable it's survived in power for so long, because if you think back to its origins, uh, it was placed in power by the Vietnamese. It was made up of ex-Khmer Rouge fighters just after the Khmer Rouge genocide, and the Vietnamese are the historic nemesis of Cambodian nationalism, right? And you still see the CNRP in opposition using this kind of Vietnamese uh, connection to the CPP um, even today. I mean, in, 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 in polling in, in, in the... the, the, the the 2000s and, and afterwards, you saw that the immigration and the Vietnam question was still one of the most important things for, 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 for Cambodian voters. Um, the regime also endured through two decades of civil war in the 1980s and 90s, and the antagonists in the war were actually then able to come into the country in 1993 or in the 1990s. Um, uh, and, and compete in elections that the CPP actually lost. And then these elections for, 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 for two decades then proved a, a, a rallying point for contentious politics that happens uh, in Cambodia um, all the time. You know, you see around the 2003 election, you see lots of contentious politics, you see 2013, obviously the most recent example. So, you know, it's quite a, it's quite a difficult political system that the CPP has, has had to navigate. And on top of this, you have the introduction of free market capitalism from state socialism, and this has brought in enormous levels of corruption and inequality and social conflict. So you have a kind of uh, uh, you have this kind of contentious politics system. But what I try and do in the book is try to carve out or tease out the kind of dialectical relationship between these contentious politics, 
and institution and coalition formation. And that's why I kind of um, frame the book in historical terms, but also bring it up to the present day. Um, so what I try and do is show how the CPP has overcome these struggles and why this uh, has led to the institutional and coalitional makeup that we have today. So I focus on three periods of state and regime making. So first I look at the origins of, of what I term the coercion dominant ruling coalition between 75 and 79. Then focus on the consolidation of power under Hun Sen between 89 and 99. And then I turn to the period of the 2000s to 2023 and show how this system has really evolved to, to benefit Cambodia's political military uh, 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 an economic elite, elite at the expense of ordinary Com Cambodians, thereby, thereby reinforcing the importance of coercion to maintaining the system. And, you know, given the importance of, of coercion to understanding Cambodia's politics, it's remained fairly understudied in the literature on Cambodia. Um, and when I arrived in Cambodia back in 2012, the dominant uh, understanding of Cambodian politics was essentially that the CPPs was a, was a neo-patrimonial regime. Um, relying on clientelism to build popular support. So the argument was that the CPP distributed state resources um, to the elites and to the masses, um, leading to a electoral backing and a, and, a, and a general perception of popular legitimacy, you know, despite underlying authoritarian practices. You know, in some of the literature, uh, academic literature on Cambodia, it's likened almost to UMNO at the height of its power, the United uh, Malays National Organization, um, especially after the CPP's win in 2008, right? So, uh, this is a victory that many people thought would then be repeated in 2013, but then, as we all know, that, that didn't happen. Um, also, a lot of this clientelism, um, focus on clientelism, has been coupled with culturalist assumptions suggesting that Cambodian politics um, follows long-standing uh, 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 notions of deference to authority. So it's a real static view of state society and relations in Cambodia. Um, and, and we often see the idea that this, this support of the CPP was just a continuation of, of, of deference to hierarchical cultural uh, values. Um, but this narrative doesn't really chime with what we've actually seen in Cambodia, which is episodic bouts of contentious politics, where people voted against the CPP in 1993. Um, there was a coup d'etat or coup de force in 1997 ahead of the 1998 elections, which the CPP thought it could, might, might have lost. Then you have the Alliance of Democrats in 2004, um, again, mass street protests, and then in 2013, you have mass protests, a big counter movement. Um, but it also doesn't really align with um, what we saw going on in Cambodia in the 2000s, right? So when I arrived in uh, ad hoc, uh, the, the Cambodian NGO I was working for in 2012, Cambodia was experiencing its land grabbing crisis. Right, and the first, I remember my first week at, uh, at the organization, um, a community came to the office um, because they'd been granted a social land concession, so this is land given to poor communities. But then what had actually happened was a general had come and kicked them off the land, um, d disabled the community represented and raped her daughter. They, this came to, and so you see this contradiction in the system. So you see on the one hand you have this land as patronage which is supposed to build reciprocal electoral clients, you know, these are the people who are going to vote for the CVP, but then on the other hand you see um, elite benefits and, going, uh, uh, and getting away with it. Um, uh, another example that always sticks in my mind is I remember going to uh, 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 visit a community just outside Phnom Penh where uh, all of the villagers were wearing CPP shirts, so they all had the Theravada um, Buddha, uh, uh, angel, sorry, um, insignia. Um, but actually, they were complaining about having their land stolen by Ye Pu, who's one of the Chong Sapiet, who's one of the um, foremost uh, Cambodian tycoons, um, uh, married to Lao Man Keng. Um, Kin, sorry. Um, and so this really kind of showed the contradictions in the system. So what happened that day is this community who was wearing these CPP shirts went to, 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 to the community representative, the Maypum, then they were going to the commune uh, uh, chief's office, and then they were going to Phnom Penh to, to complain about, right, what, about what happened. But what actually happens is they get in their CPP shirts, they get arrested and beaten. Um, and so you see this kind of contradiction and how this coercive system works in contradiction or conflict with this um, you know, uh, uh, patronage system. And this was happening across the country at the time. And this wasn't just in the highland areas, you know, up in Ratnakiri and Mondokiri. We also see it happening you know, in the lowlands, you know, the areas that's supposed to be the area that is, 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 is the, 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 CPP, the CPP's electoral ballywick. So you see this contradictory system. So that system then starts to look, to look very hollow. 
And then, of course, post-2013, we see the coercion at the heart of the system really exposed. So you have the crackdowns on NGOs, you have the, the January 2014 crackdowns, the killing of MSOCOM, um, you have uh, you know, the, 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 the closure of independent media and essentially now the closed you know, of political space that we see happen in Cambodia. But as yet, at least in the academic literature, I know obviously journalists have been writing about it a, 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 a lot, but um, you don't really have a sustained analysis of, of, of the coercive institutions in Cambodia, how they came to be where they are and how they relate to this kind of coalition forming that's been, that's been, that's been, um, that's, that's happening. And obviously we see about the coercion still underpin underpinning the system, you know, the arrest of Mekdara, uh, 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 Sengtiri, you know, all of these people who, who are still uh, in, in, in trouble, Sun Chanti, um, all of these people who are still suffering the, the coercion in the system. Um, so this is why I try and take on um, coercion in, in the book. And so the book is organized in two parts. First, tracing the origins of the CPP's coercion intensive ruling coalition. And then in the second section, I really go on to look at how it legitimizes its rule, how it enforces its rule, and the relationship of capital to the broader political economy. And so I'll go on to, 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 to discuss some of this now. So as I say, the book's really interested in, in the historically constituted nature of the CPP uh, uh, state, because that really explains how the institutions became embedded when they did. Um, and so I look first at the, the period uh, 75 to 89, and this period is characterized by this Khmer Rouge destruction um, um, of the state and its institution, the murdering of the pre-existing uh, uh, political elite and post-colonial political elite, many of whom, or some of whom that weren't murdered, went to the borders with Thailand. Um, and, but what this means is on, in the 1980s, you see a period of state and regi regime making um, in Cambodia under Vietnamese direction, in where really blank slates are pretty rare in politics, but actually what we have is the, is the making of institutions from nothing, because the Khmer Rouge were very uh, good at destroying institutions and um, killing uh, members of the elite, and those that they didn't kill, many of whom then left the country to go to, to, go to be in the borders of Thailand. Um, and so you have this, Viet this Vietnamese period of state building, but under Cambodian leaders who become more and more politically powerful in the system. So you have, this is when you have um, the emergence, obviously, of Hun Sen, Chair Sim, um, um, Heng Sam Rin, you know, the kind of old uh, CPP uh, uh, stalwarts who became increasingly in control of the system. But what we also have is you don't have a party that is deeply rooted or embedded within society. So if Cambodia was really like Umno, you know, it would have, uh, the CPP would have co-opted pre-existing um, village leaders, local leaders in different areas. Um, but that, that system didn't exist. It had been destroyed by the Khmer Rouge. So what you have is these externally created, um, uh, 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 imposed political system made up of ex, mainly ex Khmer Rouge who um, don't have that level of social embedding. Um, and this is what you need to, to have if you're going to sustain these reciprocal clientelist relations. Um, and also what you, don't ha what you have at the, uh, the same time is, is, is the, the Cambodian People's Revolutionary Party, the forerunner of the, the, the CPP, only had about 1,000 members um, in 1984, so five years after. It's only really towards the end of the 1980s and early 1990s that you see the CPP trying to build a bigger party by essentially sometimes cajoling, sometimes forcing, sometimes co-opting the former PRK state into the, into the party. And it was essentially a party made up of soldiers uh, and, uh, and bureaucrats. Um, but also at this time, you see that, that so the, the, the Khmer Rouge have, 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 have fled to, to Thailand. You know, the Lon Nol forces and forces loyal, loyal to Sihanouk have got, all gone to Thailand. Um, and what this means is you have heavily armed um, antagonists on the border. So th there was a heavy focus on security in Cambodia in the 1980s. So you see the building up of the security forces under this condition of massive threat. Um, and this created a, an intensely coercive regime, um, very aware that it wasn't particularly popular at home, um, uh, that functions essentially as a police state, right? You have paramilitaries um, um, in the country um, chasing down um, 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 dissenters and such like. So you see essentially a, a police state in Cambodia at this time. And this was really Im important for institution building because it meant that the main focus of the CPP at this time was the building up of the security architecture. So the military, the police, the paramilitary security forces. So you might have heard of the A-teams, which were these attack forces, uh, many of whom then later became incorporated into the, the units that we know now, the Brigade 70, 911, such like the gendarmes. Um, so, but you know, the institutional roots of this structure was in this kind of police state of the 80s. 
Um, but at the same time, here in the 80s, you have the beginning of the crony capitalist um, political economy that we see in Cambodia now. Um, so here you have goods are extracted um, and profits distribu distributed between state party, military, and nascent um, business elite. So a lot of um, you know, Cambodia's most famous tycoons got to start in the smuggling operations of the 1980s. They were running uh, 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 cigarettes and alcohol you know, between Thailand uh, uh, and, and, and Vietnam, or also smuggling things into the country. Um, there's, you know, the the country has, has an aid economy, so this centralizes resources under the CPP, uh, or, sorry, under the PRK state, um, leading to widespread corruption as well. Uh, food and material distributions were controlled from Phnom Penh, and local officials siphoned off food and resources for personal great uh, gain, creating a system that funneled you know, private property into state, uh, state property into private hands. Now, by the time the UN peacekeeping mission came in, UNTAC, United Nations Transitional Authority in Cambodia, comes in in the 1990s. Informal trading networks along the Thai bar border had begun to establish these powerful uh, uh, elites working, you know, made up of CPP officials and nascent capitalist entrepreneurs who would later go on to exploit this burgeoning capitalist market that, that comes in with UNTAC later. Oh, sorry, I've, I, I haven't been... I, did, I wasn't pushing through the, the slides. Apologies. And so this really sets the parameters, though, for the state-society relations that we have in Cambodia and the coalition that has, has evolved over time. So essentially, you have the emergence of a state party PRK apparatus that was intensely uh, coercive in nature, without popular support, and with little to no social embedding, having been imposed from the top down under Vietnamese tutelage, aligned now with this um, uh, uh, dependent capitalist class. And this is the coalition then that has to go in and deal with UNTAC. So under UNTAC, uh, the PRK state and its uh, officials were empowered to, um, uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, yeah, so what we see actually is the, the, the antagonists of the 1980s then coming into Cambodia, being allowed into Cambodia under, under UNTAC, um, and this had the potential to unseat the CPP um, in elections, right? So as I said a couple of times now, they actually lost the 1993 uh, election and this this antagonists were made up of uh, the Funsin party, which was now under Ranarid, but linked to uh, 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 Sihanouk, who was uh, still a very popular figure in the country, um, and these had a, a, a fair degree of popularity. And then you also have the Khmer Rouge, who weren't popular but were very well armed at the time. Um, and this set the stage then to shape the CPP as we see it kind of today in, 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 in coercive ways and in institution building ways. Um, UNTAC was supposed to oversee the disarming of the warring factions in Cambodia, uh, but it didn't. So the Khmer Rouge abandoned the UNTAC process, um, giving other factions an excuse, uh, an excuse to keep their guns. Um, elections were held, as I said, in 1993, but the CPP lost, but threatened on a secessionist, uh, threatened them to succeed some provinces um, if they weren't allowed a power sharing agreement, if they didn't come in with a power sharing agreement. Um, and what this really did is it showed the kind of CPP's uh, military military uh, uh, superiority, force superiority, uh, but it also kind of demonstrates its popularity amongst ordinary Cambodians was already starting at a, a fairly low base. Um, and then, you know, I think the story of what happened in UNTAC is fairly well told, but it's really important for, for coalition building and institution building. Um, because you see ministries um, divided along factional lines, and even the newly supposedly neutral RACAF, Royal Cambodian Armed Forces, um, was, was very factionalized with the, with the CPP element, factional elephant, by, by far and away the strongest. Um, the CPP, as I said, proved pretty, pretty capable of, of, of co-opting its former PRK administrative structures in the party, and the party becomes really the election fi fighting arm of the former C uh, uh, PRK state. Um, it also exposed, though, when, when you see this new um, um, power-sharing agreement, it exposes fractures within the CP, right? So not, you know, th there's less of the pie to go around. Some people get disgruntled. There's also arguments with the, the Chair Sim and, and Tsar Keng factions, you know, a, a about how they should deal with the Fun Simpek threat, right? So, so uh, people allied, allied uh, to, to Hun Sen eventually settled on the idea that the only way to do this was to get rid of it violently. Um, you also have uh, Fun Simpek, not very happy that they won the election, but essentially the junior partner in this power-sharing coalition. You have people around Ranarid saying, hey, I think we need to confront these guys militarily, which was a crazy idea, but um, that, was going, that was going on. So then you have this situation around 1996, 
where the power sharing agreement has begun to break down. At the same time, you have growing conflicts uh, within the CPP. But this was ultimately settled by Hun Sen in such a way as to consolidate his power um, um, and, and, uh, by putting into place the, uh, people who are willing to, to, to put down the, the threats to, to him violently. Um, so through the 1990s, Hun Sen had been working to build up um, uh, elite um, fighting units allied to him, right? So this is, you have the creation of the gendarmes, um, you have Brigade 911, which um, the bodyguard unit comes, uh, and you also have the bodyguard unit, um, and these are kind of um, essential kind of regime continuity units, which Hun Sen has been working to, to make personally loyal to him under commanders that have been with him for a long time. So, you know, for example, Sao Saka, who's the, the gendarme commander, was actually a Hun Sen bodyguard in the early 80s, right? So he's been working here for, for, him, him, for him by that period for 15 years, and he's been very well rewarded for, for, for doing so. And then these are the units that they then used to, to do the coup de force in, in 1997, right? And then you see the people who were willing and able. So there was an, uh, an argument that breaks out within the CPP, but you have the people who were willing and able to use force, um, take to the streets, uh, defeat Fun Simpek militarily, essentially decapitate them as a, as a military force and brutally uh, you know, wound them politically. And then the people who are willing to do this then oversee these, these elite units um, and also people who supported him uh, Hun Sen go into have the topmost positions within the security structure, right? So these people who are willing and able and now have blood on their hands um, are, are, are loyal to Hun Sen are the people who are most rewarded. So this is your people like Kung Kim, Paul Sarun, who's placed in, 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 in as a deputy within the RACAF but then becomes the, 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 the supreme commander a few years later. Uh, Mao Sapan, who's now the, 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 armed, the, the army chief, having taken over Hun Manet. Um, but at that point, he was uh, Brigade 911, I believe. Um, and this is really the kind of coercive apparatus which is still in power today, right? So it, it's been in power for, for, for a long time. Um, and it disciplined others in the party, so notably uh, Sa King and Chair Sim. Um, and it really showed who held the power, right? So you have, uh, it, you know, there was open worry within the, 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 the what came after the UNTAC UN administration that there was going to be fights on the streets between people loyal to Sa Keng and people loyal to Hun Sen, but it didn't happen. And what's happened ever since is Sa Keng has got in line behind Hun Sen's position. Um, and the repeated kind of suggestions that his faction will come somehow um, threaten Hun Sen, I don't think really has much, much, much sway. But also at this time, you also see the military engaged uh, uh, a lot in, in, in economic activities and forging uh, 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 linkages with these nascent economic elites that I spoke to. Um, so what you have is, 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 is a situation where, where the CPP is dominating the state's administrative structure. And it's in this best position to provide the legal protection for um, nascent economic tycoons and military elites to carry out the extraction of, of resources. You know, timber is kind of the key thing in the, two, in the 90s. Um, also, you see that dispossession in, 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 um, in urban areas as well. Um, and you also see people who are part of the former PRK state um, getting the access to the best land and real estate deals. It always surprised me when people you, you meet in Cambodia working as journalists or whatever are always surprised that you know, the landlord of their building is just a humble civil servant. It's like this was... That, 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 that they were gifted or given the opportunities to make money at this time. Um, and this is the basis then of this crony capitalist system that we still see in power today. So the, sa the same people now that are linked to the, the, the cybercrime epidemic were the people who were, who were, who were doing logs in the 90s and, and doing economic land concessions in the 2000s. So these networks were, were entrenched in the, at this time. And these, they still dominate Cambodia's economy today. So this now is people like uh, Sok Kong, Leon Pat, um, you know, they were emerged and able to leverage their early connections to build their conglomerates. So Cambodian, Cambodia's economy is, is really dominated by just a few conglomerates who aren't specialised in anything in particular, but what they really do is provide access and resources and land to do your, your thing on. They, but, they, you know, they haven't, they haven't built their conglomerates by being amazing at anything rather than um, having connections to, to the ruling party and Hun Sen and, and fitting into this system. Um, and so the upshot in this decade is we have this symbiosis between military, political and economic elites which make up this, this ruling coalition that I speak about as in power today. And what emerged is a system dominated by Hun Sen who enjoyed the support of elite military units bound to him by loyalty and patronage, also having committed uh, uh, various crimes which um, 
yeah, it tied them even closer to, 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 to the party because they have an interest in their survival so they don't get in trouble for the things that they've done. Um, under commanders who are integrated within the CPP at the highest level. So these people, these commanders become top members of the CPP's central committee. And you see the blurring of the, of the military, and, 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 uh, military um, and political apparatus even further. So the CPP was far from a kind of socially embedded clientelist autocracy, but it was perfectly suited to maintain power via um, coercion and overseeing an exclusive and extractive patronage system anchored in resource um, exploitation, which is what I try and uh, tease out in the next section to really kind of point at the kind of hollowness of the clientelism that we see in the, in, in the CPP's popular, popular clientelism and also um, you know, see the conflicts and state society cleavages that th this creates. And this really is perfectly encapsulated with the land grabbing epidemic um, in the 2000s, right? So between 2003 and 2013, large scales of Cambodia's land were uh, 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 leased as land concessions to Cambodian tycoons working with foreign companies. You, you, at this time, you see hundreds of thousands of people displaced or lost land. You see massive increase in rural poverty, internal and external uh, migration and land dependency. Um, you know, the CPP has brought, uh, the, you know, it's a very, it's a very, uh, uh, repeated um, fact that the CPP has brought you know, m lot of millions of people uh, out of poverty. Poverty is reduced by 50% in two decades, but you still have uh, around 30% of Cambodians even today are defined as near poor by the World Bank. And you still have about 15, 20% of Cambodians who are in poverty as defined by the World Bank. So you still see um, 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 a significant amount of poverty at this time. Um, but if you contrast this to the, 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 the tycoon senators, um, and, and much of the, much of the, most of those uh, poor people are, are, are concentrated in rural areas. And if you contrast this to, to, to you know, tycoon senators, uh, Ocnias, um, just five CPP sen senators owned around 20% of, 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 of land that have been granted as, as, as ELCs. And these tycoons were those same tycoons who was forging um, close ties with um, the CPP and the war economy of the 1990s. And this is their, this is their award, right? Um, we also see uh, continued close collusion in the economic realm between military and other officials to secure land, land grant from villages, building the kind of uh, political mi uh, military business networks, um, building on those networks that were established in the 90s, um, but massively expanded into the 2000s. Um, and this symbiosis was formalized to an extent through military sponsorship deals in which economic tycoons have directly sponsored units, including those that have, have, have cleared land for them. So a prominent example is Lee Yong Pat's sugar concessions uh, in the southwest, in which units he's directly uh, sponsored were responsible for evicting people, people from their land. But then the other side of this is you have an already uh, uh, poorly socially, in, so socially embedded um, Political, par uh, political party in the form of the CPP. Um, and you see spiraling protests over land, which happens throughout the 2000s. Um, also, you have um, wages have been suppressed, particularly after the 2008 financial crisis in the garment, uh, in the garment sector. Um, and so this kind of all feeds into a counter movement. You have people who are, who are angry at the levels of corruption. This is all in, engendered. Um, and, and this, this then turns into a kind of powerful counter movement against the CPP that we really see coming into its force in, 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 or, or, in 2013 and afterwards. Um, and when you speak to, you know, in, in my interviews with rural Cambodians, when I spoke about you know, this, the, the party working groups, the so-called CPP's patronage systems, which was supposed to link the party in the center to people in the village, Generally, the, the, what was described as a coercive system of which the, you know, the Mepum or the, 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 the people in the area surveil them, get them out to vote, um, ask them for money and donations, um, but they don't feel like this relationship is, is reciprocal, right? And, um, and then uh, there's a great paper that was written by Eng Netra who talked about the new people who are coming in to the CPP to replace the old generation at the, at the, at the, at the grassroots, and essentially they're the people who are, uh, can pass the money up the chain. Um, and that's, that's what they've been chosen for, competence in, 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 in extraction. So then we all know the story that happened then in 2013. You see labor organizations and independent um, unions put down, um, civil societies attacked, CNRPs banned by the, by the CPP-controlled judiciary, senior leaders fled aboard. And ultimately, the, the CPP's rule was again guaranteed via coercion, as it had been under uh, 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 every challenge that it has, it has faced. Um, 
And this is what we see now in Cambodia today. So we see candlelight banned from 2023, the arrest of Mekdara, uh, Tim Sitar, Seng Tiri. Um, you know, uh, it's a thread that these activists were shining a light on the activities of the political and economic uh, system that privileges the interests of tycoons and CPP officials over ordinary Cambodians. Um, so just to briefly recap the, this kind of section where it's, this is how we get this kind of coalition that I've been speaking about. Um, so we see the emergence of CPP grandees in the 1980s. You know, these are the guys who've recently handed power to their children. We see the emergence of a security structure that is loyal and has repeatedly shown its willingness to suppress dissent, not least because it benefits, you know, from doing so. Um, we see the emergence of Cambodia's capitalist elite connected to and dependent on, on the center, on political elites, state elites for contracts, soldiers working for extraction, um, and, and, and the CPP providing legal cover. Um, and then in return for this, the, the, the benefits that you know, OCNIA get from the system, they pay back into it, supporting military, uh, military units, ministries, donating to the CPP. Um, recently, you know, uh, Kyo Se has been tapped to uh, finance half of Hun Sen's Vanity Project Canal. Um, you also see, uh, um, um, yeah, he, he also donated to the, to, to, the, to the building of the CPP's new headquarters. And so what I try and argue and show in the books is how this encapsulates the state society cleavages that have, 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 have developed in the country. And it works against the interests of ordinary Cambodians who've shown actually their dissatisfaction with it uh, multiple times. So, so Cambodia, you know, against this kind of idea of this kind of static Cambodian populism, we see again and again the, 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 them uh, uh, either voting against the CPP or protesting on the streets. You, contentious politics and episodic contentious politics is, 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 is inbuilt into Cambodia's political system. Um, but that, that doesn't mean that the CPP doesn't try and, and portray an image of legitimacy. And this kind of brings us up to the, up to the present day. Um, even if that legitimacy is also deeply woven, as I argue in the book, with coercion, and in fact relies on and further reveals the coercion, coercion at the core of the system. So in the book, I deal with this on a chapter uh, looking at the narrative of stability and peace. So anybody who's spent any time reading government-aligned newspapers in Cambodia or listened to Hun Sen's speeches, now Hun Manet's speeches, you'll hear them talk about um, 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 the, the colour revolution, right? Um, an instability um, and that will happen um, you know, if, if a colour revolution takes root in, 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 in the country. And what they're essentially arguing, so they, 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 they state out a narrative that the CPP has, been, um, uh, has brought peace to the country, has brought development to the country, and has brought stability to the country. Um, and if the CPP is removed from power, what you'll get is chaos and even civil war. And essentially, this relies on a vision of Cambodia's politics that seeks to maintain the CPP's position uh, in power in perpetuity, as, as then guarantors of this peace and stability. So anybody who criticizes the government uh, is accused of causing instability, instability and is therefore a legitimate target for suppression. Uh, this is how the CPP has also attempted to push back on criticism from the US, EU and others or democratic countries um, who criticised it. You know, they're portrayed as fomenting uh, colour revolution and trying to bring the country back to the, the bloody days of, of the 1970s or kind of have a, a, a Syria style conflict. Um, we saw this narrative really uh, develop and be employed time and time again during the political crisis of 2013 to 2018, justifying the violence meted out to Labour demonstrators, CNRP protests, uh, you know, saw in January 2014, um, and one to justify this broader crackdown on independent media. Um, so in essence, the CPP has created a narrative of stability and peace it uses as cover for repression against those who might seek an alternative non-CPP future. Um, and again, in this narrative, the, 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 the military and security forces are, are, are key, right? So when I asked, um, uh, when I asked uh, Sal Sakar, how do you know who is, is right to suppress? He says, because we have laws, I must protect it. It's the job of the gendarmes to protect the development and stability of the country. And if stability is defined as anybody who criticizes the government, that means you can use the military to essentially crack down on anybody who defines the government, uh, who defies the government or criticizes the government. And then this has been given further legal legitimacy in recent years, where we've had the passing of repressive laws, you know, the trade union law, the Lango, all of these things. And this lawfare, again, kind of reinforces this, this uh, 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 repression. Um, and this is something that Hun Manet has wholeheartedly adopted. You know, he warns of colour revolution in 2018, 2013. Um, Hun Sen was talking about it just the other day. The colour revolution, you have to be careful of it coming to Cambodia. Um, and then you have, you know, the arrest of, uh, 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 of Mekdara was on, you know, causing instability in the country. You know, that's just another example of this instability, stability narrative coming through. 
Um, but in the absence of kind of electoral legitimacy, this is the kind of le uh, uh, legitimacy that the CPP is now relying on. Um, it's kind of performatively useful, um, and, and, and it, it makes the case for the closure of democratic space. So it's focusing on this idea of development, focusing on this idea of peace and stability. Um, and that's how it kind of now um, 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 legitimizes its rule. Um, and then in the final uh, two chapters of, of, of the book, I then give a kind of in detailed institutional analysis of, of, the, of the coercive institutions of the state um, and also the relationship between the state and capital. So I've already um, discussed the origins of uh, the CPP's coercive, uh, coercive apparatus, um, but in chapter six of the book, I really go into Cambodia's security apparatus and security elites in more detail. And what, what I found really was a two-tier system. So as a, as a whole, the RACAF is, is bloated. Um, it's got large numbers of ghost soldiers, average rank and file soldiers are poorly trained, uh, poorly paid, trained and equipped, but they're allowed to work second jobs, including as security guards employed by economic tycoons to guard lands. You know, they're kept on the payroll, but in reality they, they do very little soldiering. So it's not really a, 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 a RACAF that's capable of defending the nation. Um, but the soldiers are, are kept in line for social land concessions or first in line for social land concessions. And the CPP has made meaningful attempts to reach out to soldiers through things like the Cambodian Veterans Association, <coughs> excuse me, which is headed by Khun Kim, um, who's a CPP Central Committee member. And so the CPP is keeping its soldiers you know, tied to it, tied to the party through various financial incentives, lands and other. Um, and at the, senior military, at the senior level, the military is deeply embedded within the party and vice versa. So what I think really epitomizes this is in 2013 and, and 2018, the then three topmost commanders of the military, Paul Sarun, Kun Kim, and Mao Sapan, to temporarily uh, took off their uniforms, suspended their military roles to run the party election teams in three provinces. So you see a real blurring of, 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 of the party and, and, and the military. Um, 2015, uh, as, as Human Rights Watch uh, uh, pointed out, um, a host of senior generals were inducted into the CPP Central Committee, adding to the senior commanders, which were already amongst the top-ranking members within the, the, C within the Central Committee. Um, and of course, Hermanet <coughs> didn't come to his position as Prime Minister as a civilian politician. He was a military leader, um, head of the army, um, before he was a civilian politician. And his rise through the military points to the kind of importance of coercion still for stability. Interesting, according to sources that I spoke to um, in the run-up to sort of 2018 and around the crisis period, he was ceding his own um, supporters from the National Counterterrorism Force into the provincial structure um, just to keep an eye on things. So the CPP is aware of, you know, potentially there could you know, be some soldiers who would be dissatisfied with them. Um, but in general, um, what we see is that the provincial structures of the, of the RACAF have been allowed to atrophy. Right, so, so the, 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 the regional um, um, five regions have been allowed to atrophy. And what we have now is the real military power is concentrated in elite units headquartered in and around Phnom Penh. And these are what I describe as regime continuity units, and their main function is security and control. You know, at the top level, they're commanded by the officers like Sao Sakar, Chap Pekadai, who heads Brigade 911, of course, Hing Bun Hing um, with the bodyguard unit. And these uh, the, uh, the, we can trace these back to the, the to, you, can, you can run a line from the A-teams of the 80s and the institutional um, uh, but, uh, uh, strengthening of these into, into the 90s, into the 2000s, into the present day. And they're the real um, units who, who, who are in power. So these were the units which were cracking heads after tw in 2014 um, when, when they violently put down the, the opposition protests. But these were also the same units that were involved in the coup. Um, you know, you have leading RACAF um, 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 officers are wealthy at the level of Opnias, um, and they have diverse business interests. And so what this really points then to this is this, is this two-tier military structure. So you have at the, at the heart of it is this internal security apparatus, which really is sole function is for regime continuity and um, protecting the system they've, be, they, uh, they've, they, they, they've built up. And of course, protecting the Hun family at the top of it. Okay, so in the final chapter, I really just go in to talk more about this kind of state capital relations. Um, I argue that Cambodia's tycoons are closely tied to the CPP, but importantly are dependent on the state for patronage and protection. And, and as I've already mentioned in this talk, this is rooted in the war economy and then the, 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 the networks of extraction that, 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 that developed over the 2000s. But it's important to note that the political elites 
really maintain control. Um, uh, limiting tycoon's independence and reinforcing their subordination to state and party elites. So, interestingly, you don't have any uh, Oknia. There's, oh, there's only two Oknia, Mungreti and Leon Pat, um, who are in the CPP Central Committee. They're really trying to keep um, um, political power and economic power separate. There's no children of the Oknia who were uh, um, promoted during this recent you know, intergenerational transition of power. Um, so they really try to, to keep these things separate, and this, I argue, is a protective measure. And they're also showing, um, they also show the, 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 the economic elites who's boss. So I thought <coughs> a key example of this is the arrest of, of, of an imprisonment for two years on a four-year sentence of Kit Tieng, Kit Meng's brother. Uh, Kit, Kit Meng is often thought of as the richest person in Cambodia. He seems to be back in favor now, but you know, in leaked conversations, he was threatened by Hun Sen. Um, so you're also seeing where the power lies within this, this relationship, relationship. But in exchange, you know, if, you, if you keep your head down, you can become extraordinarily wealthy. Um, lots of these people have become connected with the Hun family through business, um, uh, particularly through Hun Mana. Um, but this system is also stifling for, 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 for <clears throat> entrepreneurs and Cambodian business people because a lot of the economy is just tied up in the hands of just a few conglomerates, right? So at the end, and also, you know, there's limits. If your business is, is you know, is known for illicit activity, whether it's logging or land grabbing or now cyber scamming, there's a limit to actually the possibility of having a business outside the company or even attracting outside investment. Um, and now really driving this, 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 the engine of this patronage system now, whereas once it was logged, then it was land, now it's really Chinese investment, it's really important. This is being funneled through these same conglomerates. What you'll often see is Hun Sen go to China, or Hun Manet now is, is starting to go to China, presiding over these symbolic signing ceremonies, and what you'll have is different um, investments given out to different, uh, different tycoons. And so this is really the engine that's, that's driving this patronage system now. <clears throat> and then kind of finally taking us to where we are today, um, I look at the end of the book at the hereditary succession that we see going on in the country now. Right, so and I argue it's a protection mechanism whereby Hun Sen is attempting to protect his political dynasty in such a way as to pl placate the interests of other important elites. So, you know, obviously Hon Manet has become prime minister, although it looks like Hun Sen is still calling the, the shots on, on a lot of things. But we also see the putting in power of the children of other elites, sometimes, you know, directly, you know, TSA Ha taking over as defense minister from his dad, uh, Sasa Ka taking over as Ministry of Interior from his dad, which is objectively just a crazy thing to, 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 to be going on. Uh, but you're also seeing this across the system. And what I think they're trying to do here is they're trying to say, look, as power is transferred, we're going to have stability. Um, there's not going to be a, a power vacuum when Hun Sen dies. And, and, and if you go with this system, then all of the other elites in the system are going to be rewarded too. And then underlying this system, you have the intermarriage of all of these political and economic families. And this is one way that, that we're seeing this kind of economic elites. And there's a, a kind of a breakdown somewhat of that distinction because you know, they're, they're all marrying their children to each other. Um, or their children are all marrying each other, I should say. And... Um, and um, yeah, so, so you see this, this kind of happening. And then I think if there's a takeaway from this, it's that you know, what we've seen is, you know, uh, uh, if you look at the, the history of, of other states in Southeast Asian nations, you often see you know, historic elites, colonial empowered elites and such like who've taken over and come to, come to power. But what you see in Cambodia is you see this state, this PRK state and the people who really benefited from it now becoming a ruling class. And you know, they're... Uh, wealthy, politically connected, and whatever the kind of eventual, you know, if Hun Manet does manage to keep hold of the, the system going forward, you know, the, 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 the thing that's going to out-survive them all probably is this, is this uh, creation of a, of a, of a, of a political, uh, military, and economic elite as a, as a ruling class. All right, so thanks very much, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. I look forward to questions. That was the deep dive. <laughs> um, we're going to uh, take some questions from the floor. Um, if you have a question, please go to the mic, identify yourself, um, and uh, indicate to Neil what, what, what specific question you have. Um, and you know, we're happy to take questions for a half an hour, 45 minutes, depending on however, however long people have questions for. Because 
Uh, we really don't get the kind of programming that we're getting tonight uh, about Cambodia here at the club. And it's a shame because, um, you know, Cambodia has a direct impact on what's happening in Thailand. And we hope for uh, more of these kind of events. So uh, please go ahead. Peter Trina, club member. You never mentioned the impact on Cambodia of the special economic zones, the casinos, the scam centers, and the influence of China financially and politically. Is there any? Uh, sure, so <coughs> shall I answer that one first off? Yeah, so, so uh, in the book I do talk about the influence of China um, as, as, the, as the kind of engine. I think I mentioned it in the talk of the engine of the CPP's patronage system now. Um, but what I'm trying to show is this, this is an endogenous elite that's been created over years. China's new to the story, but now is very much facilitating what's, what's going on here. Um, I've written uh, elsewhere uh, quite a lot about scam centers, but it's not in this book. This book kind of was, was with the publishers before, before that. But, um, and, and yeah, SEZ said so just another form of, of um, patronage that goes to, goes to, goes to, um, goes to tycoons. So I've, I, wrote, I wrote a paper on um, the special economic zone, Sienukville special economic zone, for example. It's, it's um, uh, the, 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 the is in charge of it are Chung Sapip and Lao Men Kane, right? They've been uh, close allies of the, the, the uh, first family, for, the Hun Sen family for a long time. Um, Hun Sen personally thanked Lao Men Kane for bringing the investment to, to uh, Cambodia for this. Um, so yeah, it's fundamental to, to the system, but it's part of this ongoing uh, patronage system. And actually, as I, I, I've written um, elsewhere, I see the scam centers actually as an evolution of this system. So it's a new form of external uh, patronage which operates in a state which is, you know, f has been involved in illegality since the beginning. Well, so, so yeah. Well, I, di I didn't mean the, um, I wasn't complaining about the lack of detail. <laughs> it was the general impact. <clears throat> the patronage system is to improve, to give benefit to the people who benefit directly. They, they get money and power and land. But I was concerned more about Chinese political and economical uh, interests and in that they can have military bases they can own uh, the like a, a second country who are owning the property they can have naval bases mm -hmm. uh, on the coast so they can direct government policy that isn't necessarily any benefit at all mm -hmm. to anybody in Cambodia it was more that kind of influence on on a corrupt system Sure. I mean, yeah. Uh, I've also written uh, an article actually on the on the the, the, the bases and, and the Chinese um, involvement. But I think I think that the uh, often in the kind of the discussions about China and Cambodia, there isn't enough attention paid to the agency of the Cambodians um, in the Cambodian uh, the CPP regime in this, um, because um, I'm not sure that there's much evidence that they're directing policy. I think it's a it's a win-win relationship. You know, they're supplying a lot of investment and money, and in return, you know, you 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 you, you uh, fix up this base. Um, but it, you know, there are other other countries are, are, are have been told they're allowed to dock their dock their ships there. So I mean, obviously, there's a few things um, like the joint communique of ASEAN in 2012 is an example. It looked like the Cambodians were towing the line of the Chinese and on these things. But yeah, I think there's a lot of room still for Cambodian agency because what you see. You know, through the 1990s, you know, with aid and, and various things like the work of Caroline Hughes, is how deftly the Cambodian regime has managed those who are willing to give it money um, in ways that benefit it to stay in power. Um, so, yeah, so yeah, I, I, yeah, but I, I, I take your point. Thanks. Other questions? Please go ahead. Please, uh, please introduce yourself, too. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, Chris McCarthy. Um, so, question. We're running out of, Cambodia's running out of uh, rosewood trees and, and stuff to extract. Uh, Chinese property investment is, is gone. 
uh, the scam centers maybe are, are, are taking their place. Uh, but, but it sort of points to something you were saying that there's, there's a, a hollowing out of the mass clientelism system and, and possibly even the elite system because uh, there's not enough to go around. Um, what, what happens uh, then when that, that sort of ends? Um, and maybe as a sort of sub a bonus question, uh, Praxacom uh, back, Sakchenda out. Uh, word on the street is that the, the old man, Hun Sen, was very angry uh, that a lot of the elite are now cutting their own deals on the side because maybe they're not making enough uh, and, and it might have been related to that. But again, I guess my question is, um, if there's not enough spoils to go around, what's, what's happening and is that related to that? Thanks. Yeah. Sure, thanks. I mean, that's always a perennial question, what happens to uh, uh, a regime once the economic, that, that has like an economic crisis or the money runs out. I mean, that's, that's the question that's often asked, that, you know, for the fall of Suharto in Indonesia, for example, or, you know, or why um, no, we're actually able to, to, um, to, to, to maneuver it. I mean, I think there's, there's, there may be less rosewood trees, but there's still a fair amount of forest um, for them to, 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 to cut down. I mean, you have to cut down a lot of trees just to make the CPP signs all over the country. But um, I think so that there's still that there. And I think to an extent, the, uh, the if there looks like the China, the, there's a more bespoke Belt and Road Initiative now, so there might be less investment coming from China. But still, they, they inked a whole bunch of deals just last week worth billions. So there's still that coming in. You know, like, you know Cambodia is kind of a cheap date for China. It doesn't, it doesn't cost that much, you know, compared to the amount of money that was going into, 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 into Malaysia, for example. Um, and, and I, I, you know, that, that, that seems to still be continuing. And also, you know, the, the scam centers, um, yeah, there might be a crackdown on them, but there's an awful lot of people who are getting very, very wealthy. So there's a big incentive um, to, to, to keep them going. And it's at the time where, you know, there's a potentially perilous moment for, you know, the power transition. So do you want to go against um, the interests of powerful people in the country? Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, if there's an economic crisis, that would be question. But um, you kind of never really know where the brittle parts of a regime are. They all seem durable until they break down. And then you pick over it as an academic and then you're like, oh, of course, that's why. But um, so I, I don't have a good answer of what will happen. But at the moment, I don't see it happening. But, the, but there still is structural problems within the Cambodian economy. Um, and, you know, the tourism sector, for example, has slowed down. But I think that's, an, uh, that's a repetition almost of, or, or, or an evolution of what we see earlier. So tourism used to employ the second lar largest number of Cambodians. But then it's taken a massive hit because people don't want to Cambodia, go to Cambodia anymore because they're worried about scams and being trafficked. So you kind of see, again, the contradiction and the hollowness in the system. Um, so, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know, honestly, but I, 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 at the moment, it seems a mutually beneficial relationship. So China can offshore its um, manufacturing in Cambodia. Camb Cambodia needs um, manufacturing jobs. Um, you know, Chinese companies rent um, land in SEZs. Um, and, you know, the system seems to, seems to still be working uh, uh, fa fairly well at, at present. Okay, next question, please. Yep, Craig Francis, a club member. Um, just wondering, from that Thailand perspective, what's Thailand's relationship like with Cambodia these days? Is it evolving? Is it static? Um, I mean, they seem to be getting on pretty well at the moment um, and have a kind of... Uh, was, was, we were talking about the um, um, repatriating of Cambodian political um, um, refugees in February that we saw... Um, obviously, Hun Sen is almost uh, uh, famously close to, 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 to tax in. So I think we see them getting on uh, much better now than they were two decades ago anyway, or a decade and a half ago. Yeah, I, w I would just add a couple things about that because I spent a lot of time looking at that. That You had uh, Prime Minister Pei uh, Tong uh, Tan uh, lead a delegation to uh, Cambodia before she became prime minister, once she was uh, president of the of the Puyatai Party, 
and there was a meeting between her and Hun Sen, Hun Sen in his capacity as leader of the Cambodian People's Party. So there was a, there was a sort of almost a passing of the torch of the relationship from Thaksin to Pei Tong Tan. Um, you know, and, and you had, you had two uh, former prime ministers, you had Thaksin and, and his sister uh, in Phnom Penh staying overnight to help uh, Hun Sen celebrate his 72nd birthday. Um, you know, I don't know of any other, um, and that was publicized. So, I mean, it was quite clear that the message was that the, the, the Hun family and the Shinawat clan are very close. And that is, um, I mean, I think that's part of what's also driving this whole discussion about the MOU in Kokut, um, you know, where you have the right-wing nationalists in Thailand stirring up issues for uh, Pei Tong Tan and the government on the issue of the MOU in Thai-Cambodia relationships, per particularly because they're trying to make it seem like the government's going to sell out Thai sovereignty again uh, to, the, to the, the Cambodians. So, you know, this is becoming quite something within, within Thai politics as well. Next question, please. So, um, I have two questions. Uh, in, identify yourself, please. Oh, my name is Mark Goh. Okay. So the first one is, uh, I understand that a lot of the scams are actually directed at pretty much victimized Chinese citizens. Uh, if China was so powerful and more so influential, why, why do they allow that? The second part is, do you see any inflection point or like point of suffering uh, from the in the population that could turn, you know, change the regime? Yeah, so I think the fact that, I mean, the Chinese have made meaningful attempts to crack down on the scams, and I think it shows the agency of the Phnom Penh regime that they haven't been able to. You know, the fact that there was the, I can't remember the name of the, the, the movie, the Chinese movie, where there was the, uh, it was in Khmer script, which didn't actually mean anything in, in Khmer. It was just they'd use the, the script, but um, it was obviously set in Cambodia, um, has been allowed to be uh, 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 released. Um, and yeah, I think the, uh, I, they haven't been able to, to crack down because I think that the, it's, it's making a huge amount of money for the, for the um, Phnom Penh uh, regime. So yeah, I, I, I think that there is a kind of tension there that so far hasn't been settled in one way or another. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, the, um, as I say, the, 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 the Cambodian elite are doing very well out of the, the scam centers. Um, and it's a way for them to, you know, pass money around them that might maybe being tolerated to an extent. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know why they allow it. I think it's more of a case that they haven't been able or allowed to 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 stop it. I mean, it's not just the Chinese. It's it, all of the ASEAN countries are, 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 are angry at you know having their citizens in uh, scam compounds in Cambodia. Um, but as, you know, they're building new scam compounds, so it seems like it's being resisted. Um, and yeah, regime, re regime change is always a good question. I mean, the thing is that what's happened after 2013 is you've had the dismantling of the opposition, you've had the neutering of uh, you, you know, the, 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 the opposition structures, you've had um, the crackdown on civil society, you know, the unions were very powerful in Cambodia and it was a great way of mobilizing or great at mobilizing people now they're now completely controlled um essentially just having yellow unions um you know there, there's the ever threat of violence as soon as anybody sticks their head above the parapet they're uh, they're arrested or shut down often with this um stability narrative um justification um so it's very hard to have a mobilization point um around which that there could be um a, 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 a thing. I think, honestly, the, the, one of the biggest things that I think will eventually cause the CPP even more trouble that's happening now is the micro uh, finance problems. You know, Cambodia is the most indebted country on earth. Um, I remember it back, in, back in 2013 chatting to um, a police official in Mondulkiri um, whose brother was just um, setting up a micro finance uh, uh, company. I was, and I was like, well, what, what happens if they can't pay you back? And he was like, well, we take their land. So it was, it was obviously already, you know, connected to, 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 to 
um, expropriation all the way back then. And now you just have massive indebtedness, suicides um, that's happening as a result of this. So that's a, a potential point. But at the moment, there is no, um, th there's no opposition for it to rally around. It's been completely, completely destroyed. And when you did see an opposition party allowed to compete, like it, the candidate party in uh, 2023, it got 22%, which was actually pretty impressive considering what it was up against. Um, and, you know, then recently you just had the, the arrest of Sun Chanti. So anything new movement that, that happens is, is squashed. Um, um, yeah, and, and people who stick their head above the, the parapet uh, find themselves uh, potentially in a, in a lot of trouble. Um, so, yeah, as you, you saw with, uh, you know, the murder in 2015 of... Um, Oh my word, I've forgotten his name. Gamlay, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, people who do stick their heads above, it's very dangerous too. Um, and also the, 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 C, the CNRP, which you know, later became the Candlelight Party, wasn't very good at party building at the end of the day, or in party institution building. So when the senior leadership was uh, attacked, they hadn't built, uh, hadn't built a particularly strong party institutional infrastructure that could go on. I mean, it's, amaz it's amazing that they could still do you know what they do and you know that they also already have things that are you know they can be criticized and for not least their kind of anti-vietnamese xenophobia but um yeah so so yeah that's that's the answer i don't know if it's a good one another question um matt lomberg uh long time cambodia resident journalist researcher kind of building on that question i don't know if you have any more to offer but interested to hear your thoughts and thank you neil um Less than why doesn't uh, China, why can't China crack down on the scam centers or, or stop them? Um, where, I wonder what, what you think about where the balance of power sits in that. I mean, it, it was 2015, 16, Cambodia started to receive all this large ass from, from China, military stuff, roads, bridges, everything, basically anything they wanted. Mm. And then we see the scam carry on begin around 2020, and it is a huge problem. And, and I actually think that the, the release of that film that you mentioned, uh, No More Bets, I actually think that was a tool. I think the, the Chinese government actually was happy to see that released because as it, get, as it gets to the end of the, the film, the, the, the conclusion is that the Chinese police come in and, and smash everything to bits and, and mm -hmm. save, save everything, right? So I'm wondering, where I've, all, I've, been, watching, I've been reporting on the scam stuff for a while and, and wondering where there must be uh, a breaking point somewhere because on one hand Hun Sen and the, and the Cambodian regime is, is taking all this largesse and on the other hand they're harbouring these criminals who we know are like uh, you know wanted in China or, or not allowed in China or have, or have been in prison in China they're enemies of the state in China so you, you see where I'm going like how, where, at what point does China go uh, okay, we're not going to build you any more bridges while you are allowing this to go on. Or there's also a bit of a theory around that in some way, some of that money is making its way back to Xi or Xi's people or, or, or the Chinese uh, rulers. What do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, I don't... I, I can't speak to, you know, if the money's going back um, to Xi Jinping or people within the Chinese Communist Party or whoever. But... Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's, it's a good question. I don't have an answer for it. I mean, when does it, does it break? Uh, uh, I mean, the, the, CPP, the, the, the CPP was logging the country to, 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 you know, to destruction for decades, but its donors in, didn't do anything um, or didn't do that much. Um, you know, the, 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 it's, there's a 20%... Uh, reduction in, 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 in GSP and trade tariffs, you know, it's meaningful. You know, the, the, Ca the Cambodian government has a lot of experience of pushing as far as they can go their foreign partners. Um, and I don't know what, when it, the tipping point will be um, for the Chinese. But at the end of the day, as, as I said, you know, there's a lot of interest in Chinese companies investing in Cambodia um, and the influence that it potentially buys. Um, and there's a calculation, I guess, like how much does that cost? Um, for our citizens, um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I, 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 I also agree that the film was a way of saying you need to you need to get a, a handle on this, but it hasn't seemed to have worked because they're still building scam centres, and the, you know we have this we have an anti-corruption or you have a corruption crackdown on the one hand, but that's happened under Hun Manet and, and Sasa Kar this this year, 
Um, but on the other hand, you have massive expansion of scam centers. So um, I think it's still got some way to go yet. That, that's interesting that, that uh, can I say, bullshit corruption cracked down recently, which has just been a way of garnering attention to say, hey, look, the new regime's different. Um, and I think that what we'll also see now following uh, the arrest and release of Dara is, and we've already seen the start of it, a fake, another bullshit crackdown on the scam centres, whereby the government will then go and say, look, we don't need uh, big mouth journalists who post silly stuff on Facebook. We can do this ourselves. Um, yeah, I did have a question at the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I still can't imagine why the, why the... I mean, what, what possibly could be the reasons that China doesn't cut off, you know, the ongoing pouring money into Cambodia? Or, or maybe, do, maybe they don't really... Maybe, they, maybe the money is flowing back so much and there's such a grey area between you know, the scam centres, and a lot of the scam centres appear to come under the Prince Group, you know, which, the boss of which is officially an advisor to the Prime Minister. Um, and then is also, there was that investigative piece that Jack did for RFA that showed that the, the, the kind of, where he'd come from and who he was connected to, and he is also heavily connected within the, the C, CP apparatus. So it's, all, it's also great that I guess we're just left here to scratch our heads and Ask half questions. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Yeah, I mean, I haven't got any, anything more to build on that in the sense that I don't know when, when if or when it will yeah. go t too far. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a big question because if it continues like this, um, it's a huge thing. I mean, you saw what looked like a bit of a crackdown happening in Myanmar, but then it seems to have eased off a bit, so. Yeah. Um, more questions? I, 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 I want to add, let people who haven't asked a question first to ask a question if they want to. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure the one. Yeah, you you in, indicated you want. Uh, I mean, we want we'll have we'll stay as long as you like for questions, so that's not a problem. But the thing is, uh, you know, everybody gets a chance, so please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Susanna. Uh, thank you for the lecture. I have two questions that are unrelated. The first one is, I know nothing. Could you tell me a bit more about how Chinese investments are channeled into Cambodia? Like what percentage comes from the Chinese state and what percentage comes from private investors? And when it comes to access to this funding, who decides which industries or which, um, you know, which cronies get the money? Um, the second question is, I only know Hun Manet from this new elite, of course. But given his background, I assume many of his peers are similar. They studied at Western universities and they had access to wealth and privilege growing up. Are they different than their father's generation? And do you think they use any new techniques in terms of how they rule because of who they are? Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, thanks for your questions. Um, so I don't know the exact percentage of Chinese investment that's state and private, but there's usually a bit of a, 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 a mixture of what happens. So you usually you have private companies investing in agriculture and things like this. Um, then you have state-owned enterprises which are investing in the hydropower and doing a lot of the, that, those kind of big projects. So the kind of things that uh, Chinese investment, how it usually operates in, in other countries. So that's usually the division. Um, in terms of how it's divvied up, um, you know, say for example, the Sienukville Special Economic Zone. Um, uh, Lao Ming Keng was said to have uh, close connections with the uh, provincial company that in China that uh, ended up um, um, building that. Um, but also, what you usually see is so Hun Sen and now Hun Manet was the head of the Council for the Development of Cambodia, um, which is kind of the 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 the, the institution that channels where you know development um, is, is is made. And you know, and, and what, what you'll see sometimes is just different, different. Um, like, so in one of these signing ceremonies, there'll be like five or six big projects signed or more, and they'll just have a tycoon's, tycoon's name and, uh, and company next to it. But uh, I, I was speaking to Phil about in Cambodia, you don't have companies that are particularly specialist really at one thing. They all do everything because what they sell is access and 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 and, and, and a local partner. Um, so that you know they don't function like companies you know that you'd be taught about in a, like a U.S. business school or something. They're 
uh, focused on, on, on that. So I don't know how it gets divvied up exactly, but it seems to be divvied up from, from, from the top. Um, the next question, Hummanet, are they different? Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I've not met Hummanet or Hun Sen, uh, but, you know, obviously they're on the surface quite different. You know, Hun Sen was a, 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 can speak the, speaks like a, you know, can speak the language to rural Cambodians. He, uh, he is, um, he was a soldier, ex Khmer Rouge member, middle, middle ranking Khmer Rouge. He was foreign minister at 29. Um, you know, he, his kind of regime was forged in sort of civil war and, 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 and you know, it was an existential um, um, battle that they were essentially fighting in the 80s and, and into the 90s to stay, to stay in power. Um, Homan, yeah, is West Point graduate, um, speaks fluent English, uh, you know, did a PhD in uh, Bristol on, I think, small and medium-sized enterprise, sm uh, prize, uh, small and medium-sized enterprise or business partnering or something like this. Um, but, you know, Hermanet now is, is, talking, is talking the, 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 the talk. Um, he's using the Color Revolution narrative that his dad's used. Um, you know, Mekdra and all these other people have been arrested on his watch. Um, so it seems like he's trying to, or works within the parameters of the system that, uh, that, that uh, was created be before him. And I mean, you know, the rumors were that he was quite comfortable with um, the crackdowns that happened in January 2014. Um, also that um, he, uh, um, yeah, just was involved in the whole color narrative crisis thing. So, so what we've seen so far, you know, he's also got to keep this whole patronage machine spinning um, as well. So what we've seen is he seems to be operating in somewhat similar ways, but perhaps with a, 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 a you know, a, a less confrontational tone. Um, but we don't know. I mean, we don't know until he actually really seems to take power. And at the moment, mm. you know, his dad still seems to be calling the shots. Um, and sometimes telling him off in, in public and praising him in public. And, you know, these guys are basically taking their dads to work at the time. So it's, it's not doing much for their authority. More questions? Uh, so it's a follow-up question. Um, it seems to me that, you know, the fact that China allowed that film or promoted that film, it's unlikely they're getting something back for the, for the scams. So I'm wondering how important is it politically for China to have a loyal partner in, in the ASEAN member, considering that there are you know, controver controversy, conflicts between uh, China with some of the ASEAN members you know, in the South China Sea, for example. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that, that dependency on having a loyal mem uh, you know, friend in the, uh, in the member, as a member of ASEAN to veto, let's say, uh, sanction or whatever declaration, hmm. that might drive the, the overlooking of, you know, victimization mm -hmm. of their citizens. Mm -hmm. um, I, mean, I don't if you have a... Yeah, I mean, I don't that. know that overdrives how they feel about it in terms of the scam, but it's definitely useful to have a, 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 an ally within ASEAN. You know, ASEAN works on consensus. So if you have one member that will buck the consensus, um, it doing things in your favor, then yeah, it's a very um, useful ally to have. And you know, we see the confrontation with the Philippines going on, and such like having a, a, a partner in, in Cambodia is you know, obviously a, a useful, a useful uh, ally to have. Um, yeah. Well, it used to be said that uh, 2007, 2008, that whenever you had an ASEAN meeting, the people who would pop out of the ASEAN meeting and make the first call to Beijing were then uh, the SPDC a military junta in, in Myanmar. And then, you know, uh, they, they moved towards the West periodically. And then Cambodia came in and sort of became the new best friend of China in, in ASEAN. Uh, I have a question for you about um, Cambodia's relations with ASEAN because, you know, you have the Secretary General of ASEAN who is now a Cam uh, Khmer. Uh, but the only times we've not seen ASEAN sort of uh, leader statements have been the two times that Cambodia have chaired ASEAN. Mm -hmm. um, every other time, 
you have uh, you have an ASEAN conclusion. So there, there's something that obviously there's a there's a degree of uh, irritation I think with Cambodia uh, uh, upholding uh, various agendas, including China's agenda, amongst the other ASEAN countries. And how's that going to fare for for Cambodia? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, I think that's a, I think that's an open an open question. So yeah, obviously we have now the Cambodians ahead of ASEAN, but. This, there's been this kind of complicated relationship now for, you know, at least since 2012. Mm. Um, last year, you know, there was a fairly, you know, Cambodia was, um, you know, the chair of the ASEAN, there was a fairly kind of non-controversial year, but, you know, they still struggled to get a, a consensus position on uh, Myanmar, for example, you know, whether or not that Myanmar is going to be invited to ASEAN. Um, so yeah, I think it's I think it's a difficult relationship for all the reasons we've 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 um, laid out, and yeah, obviously the South China Sea is a huge, huge partner, and then this confrontation with the Philippines is 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 is, is going to be a, a, a big thing as well, you know, because that's an awkward position to be in, and it also complicates Cambodia's relationship with Vietnam, for example, as well. So there's all sorts of all sorts of things going on there. Yeah, what is actually one other question I have? I mean, what has happened to Cambodia's relationship with Vietnam? Because, you know, you have Vietnam on one hand uh, had a very close relationship with with Hun Sen. Uh, you know, was was responsible in part for delivering Hun Sen and and the leadership of the PRK back into Phnom Penh in in, in late '79, early '80, um, and you know, Vietnam in the early years. You know, played the, the determinant role. I mean, it was in fact China was the em enemy. He was supporting mm -hmm. the Khmer Rouge, and you had Vietnam supporting the PRK. So, why are we not hearing more objections from Vietnam about the massive growth of Chinese influence in Cambodia? Yeah, no, that that's a good question, and I think, <clears throat> I mean, you've seen a little bit of disquiet over the Funan Techo Canal, for example. Um, uh, Potentially because it's yeah dual military use, but probably more to do with you know it, it affects Vietnam's trade. Um, you've but you still see a kind of often you know the the Cambodian Vietnam um, um, ministers will all meet together, defense ministers and China's defense ministers will all, all meet together. Um, you know there's strong attempts to keep this relationship uh, intact. Um, but you, yeah, you're, see, you're obviously seeing tensions in this. I mean, a, a key kind of case in point is the, is the Riem naval base. Is you know a bit of it that the, the Vietnamese built was actually demolished by the Chinese, and essentially they they were removed from that part of the base. Um, and so yeah, and it's complicated. Obviously, the the the, 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 the base itself is actually close to Vietnam, it's territorial waters. So there's a lot of tensions going on. But I think it's within Vietnam's interests to you know it's it's at the same time as it's getting closer, working towards closer relations with the US, it's also working towards closer relations with Vietnam, uh, uh, with China, sorry, Vietnam is. Um, and I think it's within their interests at the moment to, 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 to keep that, to keep that um, whole thing going on. I mean, interestingly, uh, the people who really changed their attitudes to Vietnam is the opposition, who in uh, 20, you know, around 2013 was saying met lots of things about Vietnam, but now you know, after 2013, you had um, uh, Sam Rainsy speaking publicly about having, you know, a common enemy with the Vietnamese in China. Mm. <laughs> so it's quite a, I mean, that's quite a turnaround from, 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 from his earlier statements. Um, so yeah, at the moment, the, I think the relationship with Vietnam seems stable. Um, the canal could, could be a problem. Um, but yeah, I think they're all working to keep their relations intact. So I, uh, there was a, a good paper written about this by Steve Heller recently about Vietnam, China, Cambodia relations. Okay, do we have any more questions? Yes, please, go ahead. Hello, good evening. Christina from Finland, and thanks for the excellent presentation. Um, just very briefly, I'm quite new to Cambodia, so this might be a stupid question, but those are obviously allowed. Um, when you have been referring to economy and companies, you, are, you have been referring to tycoons and cronies and 
this very strong linkage that there is between the party leadership and, and these companies. What about private sector outside of the tycoons and cronies? Does not exist? Is there private sector that exists mm -hmm. outside of the system? And if they do, how are they doing? Yeah, sure. So, you know, there's uh, an informal economy in Cambodia, and there's also a lot of small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, but I actually spoke to, uh, as part of this research, a couple of um, provincial heads of provincial business associations, just to actually ask them about this. And they were all, they, they talked about basically there's a ceiling. Um, you know, so you can only grow your business so far, and you, if you have to compete against any of these tycoons or Ocnias, you're not going to get the contract. Mm. Um, so it's hard to actually, you know, we don't, we haven't actually seen that many. Ironically, amongst the scams, as we're seeing new entrepreneurs emerge, um, but we haven't actually seen that many new companies in Cambodia come out in a long time. You know, and those people who have made a name for themselves have been connected to 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 the the Hun family. So, for example. Uh, 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 Leng Navatra, for example, uh, who's also goes by Neth uh, Piatra. You know, he's a Hun Sen person who's who's now become a major uh, business person. So the economy is really tightly sewn up. It's a bit like you know some some parts of Thailand where you have you know there's just a few small companies which do basically everything. Um, and in Cambodia, that's what that's what you see is uh, you know the, 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 the years ago the the, the U.S. embassy. Um, that was available and WikiLeaks did this top 10 tycoons. It's bigger than that now, but um, it's not huge. You know, there's, it's, the economy is sewn up by just a few small companies that are just now function as conglomerates that yeah, do everything. And land, real estate, hotels, uh, special economic zones. Um, yeah, so yeah, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to, to there's, a, there's a ceiling. And I remember speaking to um, some Chinese real estate guys um, who spoke about um, when they were trying to get you know get rich in the land boom in in the in the building boom in Cambodia in the twenty you know twenty sixteen twenty seventeen, they they got muscled out, um, so and then you know lost a lot of money, and some of them who went back to China and then you had the influx of the grey economy um, coming in. So there's only so far you know you can go, and I think that's seen in you know if you look at yeah. So th there's a ceiling I think is is what it seems to me. But I mean I'm not an expert on, on that. I have to say. Another question? Please go ahead. My name is Anna Maria from Sweden. Uh, I have a question. You painted a very gloomy picture of the development in Cambodia, for sure. And I keep thinking, are there any positive signs, any change agents that you can see could create some kind of change going forward? I'm thinking, I mean, the current leadership is from the younger generation, but we know that there are a lot of young, engaged people, and we've seen those kind of, that kind of engagement in a number of countries. Do you see any of that, or any positive signs that you could give us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like the things I said about, you know, Cambodia coming out of, you know, huge poverty reduction, you know, unemployment, these things are positive. Um, in terms of the, the positives, I mean, I was doing a, a report for, a, for an organization recently, and when you do these reports, you have to come up with recommendations. And, <laughs> and you know, and I was just thinking, you know, where's, where's the light? And, and I've been uh, doing, a, a, I've been based on like a political settlement analysis. And the, the truth of the fact is it's gloomy. Like it is a gloomy picture. Um, the, 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 the opposition movement has been, you know, really destroyed. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's a young, the, you know, the sort of vibrant middle class in Cambodia, um, you know, in, improved, improved education amongst, uh, you know, rural and urban Cambodians. Um, but, you know, then there's only so many jobs in factories and there's out migration. Cambodia has been slow to, 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 to bounce back from COVID. The tourism hasn't really covered, uh, uh, recovered. Um, 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 Construction's taken a massive hit. Real estate bubbles collapse. There's there's a lot to be gloomy about, and it just it, you know 
it just is a, a gloomy picture and it's a gloomy picture for democracy um, at the moment and human rights at the moment in, in, in Cambodia um, but it's gloomy because that was what the CPP has purposely done to make it gloomy at least in terms of the democracy and human rights um, situation it's a strategy yeah so yeah no I, no, I don't have any uh, positives to end this with unfortunately I have another question um, we've seen since really over the last several years going 20, 20, 2019, 2020, 20, um, and, and certainly post COVID, um, a willingness of the Cambodian government to try to pursue, um, dissidents overseas. And previously they never did that. They, previously they were like, if you want to leave, leave, see you later, go to, go to um, Lowell, Massachusetts, go to France, go to wherever you want to go, see you later. But now we have, um, you know, clear evidence and indications that they are in fact pursuing people into Thailand. Uh, there was just the case of the woman uh, who is a, a domestic worker in Malaysia who put something up on Facebook saying that, you know, she thought Hun Sen was despicable and Phnom Penh uh, called the Malaysians, told them that her passport had been canceled. The Malaysian immigration went with an official from the Cambodian embassy, picked her up at the employer's house, drove her to the airport, and now she's uh, waiting trial in Cambodia for a, a statement as a domestic worker on her personal Facebook in Malaysia. So what's going on here? Why, why, why has there been a change of tactics? Why are they actively pursuing Cambodian dissidents this way overseas? Yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's a good question. It's a kind of a policy of total defeat, I think. And I think part of it's probably linked to the fact that there is gonna be a transition at some point and they're, gonna, they're trying to cut out and, and go after any kind of potential flowerings of an opposition coming into power. Um, but yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know why, 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 why that this has changed. I mean, I thought the case brought in the French courts was, was new, the, uh, 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 the um, potential defamation case that was going to be taken against a foreign journalist you know, for his work related to the scams, that was new, you know. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know what is go going on, but I think it is part of this whole, it's partly linked to this transition, I think the complete clearing of the opposition decks, um, and I think that's why we're still seeing, you know, crackdown on, on media, for example, and I wouldn't be surprised if you see further crackdown, honestly. So yeah, I, I don't know concretely why it is, but I think it's partly to do with this. Mm. Right. Okay. Questions, last questions. Otherwise we're gonna let him go and you can come up. If you have questions, uh, please do come up and talk to Neil. Uh, also recall that there are some of his books uh, for sale if you haven't had a chance to look it over or buy it, it's a very reasonable price. I'm sure he'd be willing to sign it for you. Um, and let me uh, uh, take the time to thank you for coming this far, uh, for uh, picking the FCCT as a place to do this uh, book launch. We really appreciate it. And, yeah. well, and I think that's been a, a very fascinating evening of discussion about the gloom and doom of Cambodia <laughs> under the current regime. So. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.